Thank you. That could be wrong. Somewhere around there. Just before the ad. Yeah. Okay, well. I have a note in my notes here. Start with verse 43 of chapter 30. Okay. See why we, why we take notes is so important. Genesis chapter 30, verse 43, lets us know the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maid servants and men servants and camels and asses. And he heard the words of Laban's son, verse 1 of Genesis 31, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he begotten, or he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld that the countenance of Laban, his father-in-law, and behold, it was not toward him as it was before. So, what's happening in what we're told is, remember, Jacob got all the stronger of the livestock, and Laban was left with the weaker of the livestock, in that Jacob was increasing in, in much. <laughs> but not everyone will be happy with it. He's getting wealthy, and Laban's sons, note, are upset, and kind of blaming Jacob now uh, on what's happening with Laban, their father, saying, uh, you know, he's taking it. He's taking everything. And the Lord, verse 3, says to Jacob now, Return unto the land of thy fathers and thy kindred, and I will be with thee. I underlined that at the end of verse 3, because people might be against you. They might not be for this idea. They might all, not all be on board. Some of them might even be uh, antagonizing you and uh, kind of trying to get a rise out of you or trying to get you angry. Um, but the most important thing is, I will be with you. The Lord says to Jacob, the only reason the Lord ever says that to anyone is they needed to hear it. Jacob in this, at this point needed to hear that. And for me, at this point in my life, I need to hear that. Yeah. I am with you, Mike. <laughs> I am with you. I know everyone else is against you. Everyone else isn't with you. <laughs> They're not on board. They're questioning everything. But I'm with you. And that's just such a blessing, isn't it? By, uh, well, the, the envious uh, jealousy, that kind of stuff sets in, whether it's envy or jealousy, Rachel and Leah, or Leah, however you're supposed to pronounce it, Rachel and <laughs> Leah were... They knew a lot about being jealous and envious. And we don't really think about it much, but right here, Laban's sons are beginning to get jealous and envious. And the very emotion, the very idea of us being envious or jealous, <laughs> jealous <laughs> is in that moment of feeling that way where it sets in, you are actually challenging the very sovereignty and will of God. We don't really think about it that way, do we? I'm jealous of him. I'm envious of her. I'm covetous of this. You're challenging in that very emotion, <laughs> you're challenging the will of God. And that's exactly what Laban's sons were doing. That's exactly what Rachel before was doing. It was the will of God that Leah would be blessed and be having these sons, and she found herself envious, jealous. And that very thing is challenging the will of God. In that, I disagree with what you're doing here, Lord. The will of God. I disagree with 
the will of God. See, we don't think of it much, but is it no wonder it's in the Big Ten. Thou shalt not covet. And we, we read about it over and over. Do, don't be envious of evildoers or of anyone around you. So, uh, God is with you, and Jacob sent. <clears throat> Verse 4, And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock, and said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it's not toward me as it was before, but the God of my father has been with me. And that's all that matters, really. <laughs> the God of my father has been with me. And ye know that with all my power I have served your father, and your father has deceived me, and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. If, I, if he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle that uh, bear speckled. And if it, he said thus, the ring straight shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straight. Thus God has taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. And it came to pass, verse 10, that the cattle conceived, and I lifted up mine eyes and <coughs> saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped, leaped upon the cattle were ring straight and speckled and grizzled. And the angel of God was the one that spoke unto me in a dream, saying, uh, Jacob. And I said, Huh? And the angel of God <laughs> said, Lift up thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban hath done unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar. Remember, poured oil on that pillar before where he named the place Bethel and where thou vowed a vow unto me now arise get thee out, of, out from this land and return unto the land of thy kindred and Rachel and Leah answered and said to him oh no we can't leave our dad no they didn't say that Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him is there any uh, portion of, or inheritance for us in our father's house? Is there any reason for us to stay here? Are we not counted of him that is of our father? Does he not think of us as strangers? For he has sold us and has quite devoured also our money. For all the riches which God has taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God has said unto thee, do. Smart wives. <coughs> this is probably the best advice anyone could ever tell you. The very last words there in verse 16. Whatsoever God has said unto you, do. Don't worry about what Laban has to say. Don't worry about what this person might think. Or this opinion might be of the thing. Whatever the matter may be. Do what God has said unto you. Then Jacob arose, uh, verse 17, and set his sons and his wives upon the cam camels, and he carried away all his cattle and all the goods uh, which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting, which he had gotten in Paddan Aram, for to go to Isaac his father in the land of Canaan. And Laban went out to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen these images that were her father's. And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban. They left without Laban being aware of it, the Syrian, uh, Laban the Syrian. And in that, he told him not uh, that he had fled. So, verse 21, he fled with all that he had, that is Jacob and all of the family, the 12 sons, well, not the 12, the 12 children, one daughter and 11 sons, and he rose up and passed over the river and he set his face toward the Mount Gilead. Uh, verse 21 is interesting. We actually get the word Hebrew from that phrase. Um, and it comes up again in Joshua 24. But it's the, the root of the word Hebrew is crossing over or passing over the river. One who's crossed over. And in Joshua 24, of course, they cross over over and they're they're called Hebrews. That's the the root of that word. Hmm. We see that it's Jacob hasn't even become Israel yet. And yet 
here the picture can be seen, right? And earlier in verse 15, the daughters, the wives of Jacob, are counted as what? Strangers. Even in their own father's house. Now, if you get saved, you come to know the Lord, you can become a stranger in your own house if you're the only one in the, in the family that gets saved. And so, that's what's happening here. The, the, uh, Jacob is on his way. By the way, Mount Gilead is uh, there in Sebastopol, out towards uh, Guerneville there on Green <laughs> Valley Road. Uh -huh. Oh no, that's a different... But the word Gilead means perpetual fountain. Uh, you do with that what you will, uh, but I think it's neat. They, they go toward the perpetual fountain, the living water we might say. And it was told, verse 22, Genesis 31, 22, it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob fled. Um, and he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days journey and they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. And God came to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night, and he said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad. You know that God always has the best advice. Does anyone know that? God always has the perfect word. And I think a, a, a key here, even though God's speaking to Laban the pagan, he, did, Laban, we're going to see, did not have a relationship with God. In fact, we've seen that so far. He calls, uh, the only reason he likes Jacob is, you know, you're like a good luck charm. You know, as long as you're here, I'm doing good. So stick around. Well, his countenance had changed, obviously. I, he didn't want, he started getting angry when uh, Jacob had made that deal before of the, uh, you know, blemished, animals, those that had stripes and kind of discolored animals, those will be mine, and those ended up being the stronger ones, and all the solid ones were his. They were just weaker. Laban caught on. But God speaks to Laban before Laban catches up with Jacob and the whole family, and he tells him something I think all of us need to take to heart, and that is that we speak not either good or bad of President Biden. We speak neither good nor bad of Gavin Newsom. That we speak neither good nor bad of any human being on the planet. What do you mean? What do you mean? God has created them in the image of God. We are created in the image of God. Now, when it comes to issues, when it comes to philosophies and ideas and uh, <laughs> theories, when it comes to those things, go ahead. Speak good, speak bad. Speak your mind. But when it comes to humans, don't be putting down any human being, good or bad. God is full of wisdom in that. You, you can be... Uh, you can be loving and still disagree with that person. You can be um, coming to that point where you agree to disagree, right? And Laban, we're going to see, had to hold back his disagreement. <laughs> he didn't just disagree. He wanted to kill uh, Jacob at this point. And Laban said to Jacob... What thou has what has you uh, thou done thou that ha you've stolen away unawares to me and carried my daughters and my and uh, my grandchildren really captives uh, taken with the sword in other words he's talking as if they've been kidnapped uh, wherefore didst thou flee away secretly and steal away from me and didn't tell me that I might have sent thee away with mirth and with songs and a timbrel and with a harp. Sure thing, Laban, sure. Trying to say that he would have threw, threw him a going away party if he'd have only, only known that they were going to leave. No, uh, that's not true. Um, he would have had plans to try and keep uh, Jacob and keep them longer. 
um, and has not suffered me to kiss my grandsons and my granddaughters, uh, that thou hast now done foolishly in so doing. It is in thy power, in the power of my hand, Laban says to Jacob, to hurt you. But God, the God of your father, spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thee, uh, take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob either good or bad. Well, all you've said to me is bad. <laughs> Where's the good, Laban? And now thou, uh, though thou wouldest need needs be gone, uh, because you soar uh, longs after thy father's house, you wanted to go home, yet wherefore hast thou stolen away my gods? And just stop for a second and praise the Lord that we serve and praise and worship a God that cannot be stolen. Isn't that awesome? You know, we're not... Huh. He stole my gods. And it's not gods plural for us, right? It's, it's not these little trinkets. That's exactly what they were. They're, the teraphim is the technical term there for the gods. And they're brought up over and over. In fact, the tribe of Dan will get into trouble later in the book of Judges for using these terabed, uh, terabim, terathem, sorry. That was terathem. Uh, and that's what these false gods were. They were little statues, little trinkets um, that would become used for, uh, well, divination. Used for um, inquiring of evil spirits to guide, uh, to inquire of even the dead at times. Um, you can see 1 Samuel 19, verse 13. 1 Samuel 19, 13, Saul has a daughter Everybody thinks her name's Michael. It's not. It's uh, Mickle. Um, <laughs> but Saul's daughter was this uh, necromancer, and she used these very same things, these uh, teraphim, to uh, kind of use that kind of divination. It's wicked stuff, and it's all from the culture of the Syrians, the enemies there, um, where Laban the pagan was from. And Rachel was affected. Dad, listen up. You may not think that your daughters are affected by the stuff you're allowing into your mind or into your house. Get rid of those false gods, whatever they are. And how sad that they could be stolen. So he's really angry that the gods have been stolen. And the other thing about these terra, teraphims is that many of them believe to have a link to the inheritance. The family inheritance was linked with these gods. So you can see why Rachel stole them. And uh, it makes a little more sense in that, in that case. Um, these were important little uh, gods to these guys. Um, and Jacob answered and said... To Laban, because he was, I was afraid. That's why I, I left without telling you. I was afraid, for I said, preventure that thou would take by force thy daughters from me. With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let them not live. In other words, uh, and before our brethren discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had been the one that stolen them. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' tents, and he found them not. Thou went he also into uh, Leah's tent, and entered into Rachel's tent. Uh-oh. <laughs> and now Rachel had taken the images, these gods, and put them in the camel's furniture, or the, under the saddle, and sat upon the saddle. And Laban searched all the tent, but he found them not. And she said, as Rachel said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the, the he found not the images. Um, Rachel's obviously 
not much different than her own father in that she's deceiving, isn't she? She's up to the same tricks that Jacob was doing. Uh, when you get married, the two become one. You start to pick up the good and the bad and the ugly. You start to pick up all those traits. You, you can't get away from it. And Rachel, we see that here. She's, she's uh, not much different than her own father, but also Jacob was no help in teaching her how to be honest. And Jacob didn't know his wife uh, well enough. He didn't communicate with her enough to, to even know what had happened, which, which becomes a huge thing here in verses 36 through 42. I call it Jacob's tantrum. <laughs> Jacob has a tantrum here. Jacob was wroth. That's, he's angry. And he chode with Laban. He was vicious with him. By, you know, uh, these, were, these were harsh words. And Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? Whereas thou hast searched all my stuff, and what hast thou found of all thy household stuff? Set it here before me uh, and my brethren, and be, uh, that they may judge between us. This twenty years have I been with thee. The ewes and the she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of the flock, of your flock, have I not eaten? And by the way, Jacob could have had every right to a, being a, the, keeping the flock to take any of them and eat as he pleased. But he didn't even do that. He says, that which was torn of beast I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it uh, on, of my hand. Didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night? You know, I took responsibility for every bit of the livestock. Thus I was, verse 40, in the day of uh, the hot drought consumed me, and the frost by night, freezing cold at night, my sleep departed from mine eyes. I kept watch all night, is the idea, that over your flock. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I served thee fourteen years for the two daughters, and six years for your cattle. And thou hast changed my wages ten times. <laughs> if it weren't for the God of my father, uh, the God of Abraham. And this is interesting. A name of God that you and I don't really think much of. We don't even think <laughs> and, and call it by this, but the fear of Isaac. That is God of Isaac. Fear, quite literally, is the name of God there. There's a whole sermon in that. If it weren't for Him who had been with me, surely Thou hast sent me away now empty. God, though, God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you yesternight. You know, when God told Abraham or Laban all about uh, not speaking either evil or uh, good of Jacob. But what's happening here? Jacob is, is uh, throwing a fit. Um, and it's always sad to see someone throw a fit like this. He's getting more and more angry, upset. He's, he's uh, lashing out. And the saddest part about it is Jacob is wrong. He's wrong. Laban was right. Somebody took his gods, stole something. Was it sad that, that he put so much into these gods? Yeah. But it, may, it didn't make it right that they were stolen. And in his love for Rachel and in his anger, he gets blind to facts. He's blinded by, he's blind to anything that has, holds any weight. And he's just going off on this and that. And, and, you know, I've worked for you 20 years. I've done this and that. And I'm, I, you know, espousing all of his own works, if you will. They all amount up to nothing. <laughs> and in that, he's wrong. He's wrong. He doesn't realize his own wife had taken them. And I, I had to just 
let it be another one who says, you know, he's worked here for 30 years instead of you. He says, you know, I've worked for this company for 30 years. Let it be someone else that takes note of that. Even in our marriages. <laughs> let it be someone else that says, they've been married for that long instead of us walking around with, I've been married now for 40 years, whatever it may be. Listen, let it be another that praises you and lifts you up. And not your own mouth. You're foolish in this, Jacob. Spouting out every accomplishment that you've made. I've done this for the years and past. I've taught this many classes. I've taken this many, whatever it may be. And let it be someone else that notices that. And ultimately, let it be the Lord. Otherwise, we're in danger of, you have your reward. Right there. That tantrum that you threw, Jacob, there you have it. I hope it feels good that now Laban knows that you worked real hard and stayed up all night watching his flock and being a good shepherd, being a good uh, husbandman. And it's just uh, sad to see. But Jacob is here in our story. We're going to talk a little more, but let's finish out the chapter here. Because Laban answered, verse 43, and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, grandchildren, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters, or unto their children which they have borne? Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, or quite literally, cut covenant. Um, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillow. He was used to that. No, this was for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. And uh, Laban called it Jegarshadutha. Jigar, right? You all know what that means. But Jacob called it Galid. So one was in the uh, Aramaic. One was in the Hebrew tongue. Or in the, the idea is Laban's calling it um, in a different language, in a whole different uh, thing, but they both see the same thing, and they both mean heap of witness. And Laban said, this heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore, was the name of it called Galid. Um, and Mizpah, <laughs> Mizpah, for he said, the Lord watch, and that's what Mizpah means is watch, between me and thee, when we are absent from one another, if thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives besides my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness between uh, me and thee. And Laban said unto Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar, which I have cast between me and thee. This heap be a witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap, to thee, and thou shalt not pass over this heap, and the pillar is unto me for harm. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. And Jacob swear by the fear of his father Isaac. There it is again. The fear is another name for God. I think we need to take note of that. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> then Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread and they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount and early in the morning Laban rose up and he kissed his 11 sons at this point and his daughters Rachel and Leah and he didn't kiss Jacob <laughs> and he blessed them and Laban departed and returned unto his place Laban the pagan you think Laban held some grudges? I think so. He was angry. Jacob, he was so angry that it rubbed off on Jacob, didn't it? Jacob had his tantrum, his moment there. But more than that, um, 
the title of the message. I've got to go all the way back to verse uh, 11 through 16 that we already read. Um, and that is, Jacob gave God the glory about the whole issue with the cattle, the whole issue with the rams, the uh, striped and spotted, uh, the livestock that were stronger. God, Jacob said, no, this was all by a dream at night, that God made that happen. That wasn't a Jacob thing, that was a God thing. <laughs> Some go into detail, we talked about putting the sticks, he took the rods, remember, and made it so the white could appear, and he put it in the water. Don't get too hung up on that, which there are books and books written on how it's possible that you could set something striped before this type of animal, and when they conceive, now they're going to have the, a striped calf, whatever it may be, a spotted calf. Don't get too hung up on that because of chapter 31, the clarification here. It was the angel of the Lord. It was God that said, look, lift up your eyes, Jacob, and see. <laughs> and this is going to be a blessing to you. This is, this is the way that you're going to have the speckled, the, the, uh, and they're going to be the stronger ones. You know, This is all going to be a God thing. It's not a Jacob thing. Did Jacob have, did he do something? Yeah. We talked about how it, just like a kid wants to help out, and I'll clean the windows, Dad, picks up the pledge, goes over to the window, you know. That's, that's kind of like Jacob. I'll put these sticks in the water, and we'll see what happens there. You know. And sure enough, God blesses it. The Lord's still blessed. But he looks, turns, and he understands now God has reiterated, God has made it clear, we need to move. We need to get out of here. We need to take a bold move. And I think it's interesting that God prepares Jacob. He prepares Leah and Rachel. And Jacob turns to them and says, uh, are you going to come with me? In essence, the title of the message, ready to move. Listen, are you ready to move? I've made my, uh, well, I've made, I've made your father angry at me. He's upset. Are you guys ready to move? Are you with me? Or do you want to stay with them? With him? And their answer lets us in on just how uh, selfish Laban really was. He's devoured our uh, money. Anything that we might have had as an inheritance. And this was a duty for any father to leave his children an inheritance. And because the women had no rights, it was all up to Laban. It was all up to their father to have this taken care of, to have a uh, dowry, a uh, financial uh, something set aside for them. And all of it was squandered. All of it, our, our father, verse 15, he's counted us for strangers. He sold us out and has devoured also our money. And Jacob has done nothing but take care of them and bless them. And it's not Jacob, but it's God who's doing the blessing. It's important for us to take note of that. But many of us can get hung up. Uh, Rachel seemed to be into these gods, these images. Um, superstitious. And she could have very well said, you know what, I'm comfortable here. I know everyone here. Let's just stick around here. And it could have been very easy, but instead she goes, no, we're out of here. The riches which God has taken from our Father, that is ours. Whatever God has said unto you, do. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy to just 
do what God has called us to do and to make those moves regardless of uh, flack. And it's no, uh, it's no coincidence. That's not a kosher word, right? There's no such thing as coincidence that we're here going through this chapter and we are physically moving as a church very soon. We're going to be moving to a new location. And just as Jacob might have asked his two wives, I'm asking you guys, ready to move? <laughs> I don't care. We're going. <laughs> Whether you're ready or not, here I come. And it's, it's really true. We need to uh, be ready to move ultimately to ultimately to go up in the air. Amen? What's that old song? Uh, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. When He comes and takes us up and we'll, we'll uh, finally be at home at last. Uh, that's not the song. But <laughs> the song is it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. All sorrow will pa be gone. There will be no more uh, sin. No more of this Jacob stuff and L Laban stuff. There's not going to be any more of that. And the biggest lesson that Jacob, I think, uh, missed at least in the text, it's not brought up yet. Another title that I thought about making this was um, Steps Towards... Uh, well, that's why I didn't title it that. <laughs> Steps Towards uh, Being Submitted, Being Sold Out for God. Because Jacob is not yet submitted. That's going to happen next week. Lord willing, if we get to chapter 32. He's going to submit, <coughs> finally, <laughs> and be submitted, subdued. That is, God will now be Lord. And in fact, Israel, in the name Israel, Jacob, Yaakov means uh, subplanter or de deceiver, heel catcher, deceiver, manipulator, whatever you want to make it. That's what Jacob means. Israel, on the other hand, means led by or governed by, lorded by God. And Jacob is on his way to being lorded by God. Governed by God. Is he God, Lord of your life? Jacob's been saved. We know that he's a worshiper at this point. But he's getting to being subdued, being submitted, coming under the mighty hand of God, where God is in charge of every area. God, um, before Jacob can get to that point, he confronts Laban. And something in here that's not easy to see is how that Laban is a giant mirror for Jacob. And in fact, Jacob could be a giant mirror for you and for me, showing us who we really can be, what we are really like. Somebody said that, you know, uh, the Word of God is a mirror. <laughs> and you can look at the mirror, but the mirror will not shave you if you're a man. The mirror simply shows you your need to be shaved for me, right? No, the mirror does not shave me. I'm shaved by grace. A joke for you. There. But, can you see it now? Can you see how the law of God, the Word of God, shows you your need to be saved? The law, the Word, that's not going to save you. It's the grace of God that finally comes along and saves us. 
Now Laban is showing Jacob his need for change. His need to be governed. Jacob says, your father, Laban, has changed my wages ten times. And maybe there's a gasp by those around. I doubt it. But that's, he says it twice in our chapter. Laban changed my wages ten times. What a crooked guy. And yet, Jacob still doesn't see how it's a giant mirror of you who have, have, has deceived your own father Isaac, your brother sold, you gave him that pot of stew and, and have been manipulating things to, to kind of get away with your own thing. Listen, it is so easy for us to, to see what the faults in others. others. Um, and oftentimes, we, we see it because it's so bad in us. If you've ever been around someone who's just really nice, who's just a, a, a really incredible person to be around, a really nice person just doesn't see faults in others. They don't. They just don't. It's just who they are. And I'm blessed to work with a few people like that. <laughs> Christians that I work with that just don't see faults in others. Where I see tons of stuff. You don't see that? Well, the only reason I see it is because it's twice as bad, triple as bad in me. Whatever the thing is. And that's the case with Jacob, I have to believe. Seeing that in his father, he changed my wages ten times. Well, you would have done it twenty times if it had been you, <laughs> Jacob. We can do that. We point our finger at someone, we, we find fault in someone, and we don't realize they're a giant mirror just showing me that's how I am. That's how I could be. And finally, my, my kids... They are not just a mirror. They mirror me. Don't they? And when they're good, they're well behaved. They're mirroring Jessica, their mom, right? But when they're evil and wicked and get up and walk around while we're trying to sing, hey, that's me. Amen. <laughs> they, they just won't stop with the tantrum and the screaming and the yelling and the selfishness that's me, me, me that's what I'm like and we all have that tendency don't we to see others uh, the faults in others and forget that wait, this is really just a mirror trying to show me and Laban finally comes to this point where he gets it <coughs> Okay, you guys are going. Um, you're moving. And God will prepare us for the move. Um, <laughs> I wrote this down too. This is Chuck Smith's kind of thing. We are by nature homebodies. That is, we like things that are familiar. And God doesn't launch us out into a new season without first giving us a word. For Jacob, it was back in verse 3. I am with thee. God will give you His word. And He will give you a word to confirm that. But we won't like it. Just as Pastor Chuck points out. We are homebodies, man. We like familiarity. We like having an air-conditioned place we could come with places for our children to go and, and things, things to be taken care of and on schedule and, and perfectly put into this structure that we have. And God wants to mess all that up. He wants to change it. He wants to move us. He wants to move you toward Him. And this is a step toward being governed by God for Jacob and Jacob's life. And Laban makes this covenant, and it's a childish covenant. It really is. It's a, it's a uh, you ever been in the back seat with your sister, 
You know, I was pretty close to Faith, my sister, growing up. And the invisible line is there in the back seat. You cross this line, and you're dead. And you cross it. That's what Laban and Jacob are like here with this covenant. Hey, listen, we set up these stones. We cut covenant. They, they actually cut an animal, and they walk between the pieces. It's uh, same idea back in Genesis 15 that God made with Abraham, that covenant. Same idea here. They were deadly serious about this. But uh, verse 49 uh, has been one of the most uh, taken out of context scriptures possibly in, in the Bible. Uh, mizpah is not a good thing. Uh, it simply means watch. But there are Christian t-shirts, <coughs> coffee mugs, Christian things... The Lord watch between you and me while we're absent from each other. You know, mitzpah, may the Lord watch over you while we're, you know, it's, it's real, sounds real nice and, and friendly. That's not the idea. It's taken completely out of context. It's the Lord has your, his eye on you when you're up to no good. And if you decide to go against this and not keep your word, He's the one that's going to deal with you. <laughs> and it's fearful. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of mighty God. <laughs> and and uh, in fact, his name, his very name is fear. The fear of Isaac. I love that. Um, and God is many things. There are, there are many names that will come across. Um, but... Laban got what he got out of Jacob because Laban out, out manipulated, he out deceived the deceiver. He did. He got away with it for 20 years. Remember originally, the original plan, I'll work for your seven years for your one daughter. And Laban turned it into a total... And it backfired on Laban big time. Wait, I'll figure out how to keep him around here for 14 years. And he'll end up with two of my daughters. And then I'll keep him another six years. And man, uh, how that backfired. And God took this mess and turned it into a message for you and I. He takes this... this uh, family that's totally uh, dysfunctional and how we you and I are blessed by this family aren't we in fact you and I are blessed by the nation of Israel aren't we don't ever forget as you're going through the life of Jacob especially. See, Abraham I have a hard time uh, relating to him. And even Isaac, we just don't have enough information about Isaac and what he was like. There's only a few little chapters on him. Um, but Jacob, <coughs> Jacob, you can really read about and you really relate to this guy. That is working for a boss that's a total jerk. <laughs> or a boss. You know, any one of us. Jacob did that. Jacob worked. And he was a witness to him. He was, he was, let his work speak for himself. You know, speak for it. Um, even though he had changed his wages ten times, right? Uh, it'd be, it's interesting, and it, it would be interesting to find out if Laban, you know, would be in heaven one day by the witness that Jacob was to him. We never know. We won't really know till we're there. Really. Um, kind of like Nebuchadnezzar, right? <laughs> this guy that saw the witness of someone who comes into work, is faithful in the little things. Jacob is perfect for that. Um, Joseph is too perfect for me to... To relate to. We'll get to Joseph eventually. But I like Jacob. Because I know who, what I'm like. And 
Jacob is here in the Word of God as a type, a shadow. And ultimately, it's that little nation of Israel. And man, are they in the news ever so uh, presently, right? This is the God of Israel. You know, we, we, we forget we're reading about Jacob and his name becomes Israel. How we need to keep (coughs) Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 11. Those three chapters, Paul's trilogy on Israel. How we need to keep those fresh in our mind. And not, with the rest of the world, start to think against and start to go against and start to not be concerned with Israel. That's God's people. God's nation. And He's coming soon, isn't He? The throne of David will be established. It has not happened yet. That promise in the Scriptures, they have a problem. (laughs) If if the Jews of today, you know, well, they have their way of getting around that. But those uh, in America, those Christians that say that Israel's done away with, We don't really need to be concerned. No, you have a big problem. The throne of David will be inhabited. Somebody will sit on the throne of David. That has not happened. And the word of God, every promise will come to pass. Will it not? (laughs) That will happen. And it's not going to be Antichrist. I'll tell you that. It's going to be the real Jesus Christ. The Messiah. To sit and reign and rule on the throne of David that will be established. Not for six months, but forever. Is it no wonder when we get to Revelation, it's called the New Jerusalem. It's not called the New Rome. It's not called the New Cuba. The New Asia. The New... Babylon. No, it's called the New Jerusalem. And God does what He does when He wants to do it and how He wants to do it. Again, where does an 800 pound gorilla sit? (laughs) Wherever He wants. That's God, in a nutshell. (laughs) Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to say (laughs) and put Him in your human little formula box, right? He's awesome. And we're reading about the very roots of that little nation of Israel. And it's it's exciting. It's really, it's awesome. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that You use and that You are called, even in the Psalms many times, the God of Jacob. Lord, may we Come to understand how that truly blesses us to understand. You are the God of Jacob. And Lord, we we just look to you for guidance, for direction. As we are preparing to move, Lord, may you make us ready, Lord. But more importantly, that we would be ready for the eternal move to our home in the sky, Lord, where you told us that you go to prepare a place for us, that where you are, we may be, we may also be in your presence forevermore. Father, we look forward to that above all other things. And we thank you, God, we praise you, we do lift up that nation of Israel. Lord, even now as all the world continues to look at it and examine and critique it. We know as believers in Your Word and what Your Word says, Lord, we know it's a spiritual thing. That what's going on over there is a spiritual battle. battle. It's a spiritual uh, prophecy with prophetic uh, meanings, Lord. But we're hanging on to you 
understanding that before your wrath is poured out, we will be taken out. That is, caught up and raptured. Lord, before any Antichrist would be unfold or come onto the scene, we will be with you forever. <laughs> and having a front row seat. So may we not be concerned with Antichrist, that we would not be concerned with the mark of the beast, but we would be concerned with Jesus Christ. And are we men and women who are marked by you? <laughs> Lord, you are such a good and gracious God. You have brought us in to the family of God. We have been grafted in, and it's by grace. It's by grace through faith in Christ. We thank you, God. For you are Lord. <laughs> Amen? Amen? For He is Lord. He, he is